The time has finally come. Will the showrunners blow minds with their epic reveals and heartbreaking conclusion? Or will everything blow up in their faces so badly that even the corporate media will turn against them? We will dig in, but quickly, before we do, please subscribe to join my kingdom so you don't miss a new video. Alright, let's begin with the Numenorians, as they have the least going on. So, Karl Marx here has gathered a number of artists and the like to capture the visage of the king before he kicks the bucket, and of course, his son isn't in prison for attempting to sabotage the expedition edition a few episodes ago. Next, we follow Isildur's sister, who everyone only vaguely remembers for two reasons, and is drawing the wrong side of the king's head somehow when his uppers kick in, and he tries to explain to her that she must be the one to guide Numenor before it is too late. He then guides her into the broom closet where they are keeping the Palantir. Then we catch up with the survivors of the expedition force. Morale is low since the volcano gave them the Colonial Marines treatment, and Elendil goes below deck to check on the progress of Queenie Wonder's new album. They have a little discussion about staying on course and completing the mission no matter what, which is a little hard to believe since Elendil was like, fuck this shit, I'm out last episode. And I can't help but feel these two will be forced into a relationship next season with all the delicacy of being T-boned by a semi. They then arrive in Numenor and we see that all the shit have raised black flags and sails, as the king has officially croaked. Next, we catch up with the hobo, wandering around the Rovanian in search of a clue as to where he's even going when he trips and loses his apple, which is picked up by Nori, who runs off and the bum has to give chase. Catching up to her, she reveals herself to be Feminem when her backup dancers appear and they proclaim him to be Sauron. The trio then spends the day trying to convince him he should travel back with them to Rune, where they will help him to regain his memories. And holy fuck! Fucking shit, they're Easterlings? And they whitewashed them? Fucking chessmate, woke tards. I guess it's time for you to hate this show like you did Doctor Strange when the Ancient One was changed from an old Tibetan man to a white Celtic woman. Moving on, the soon-to-be hashtag cancelled trio are practically cupping his balls as his powers are getting out of hand and so they have to knock him out. Around the same time, the group of hypocrites has caught up with the trio, distracting them and sneaking over to free not Gandalf. Once again, Feminem reveals herself, this time as totally not Gandalf, taking them by surprise, and one of the backup dancers throws a knife not into Nori, but into Sad Sack Sideburns who falls over dead. Finally, a main character death. So, Nori runs away, and the Stranger awakens to fight for his friend, and lasts about as long as I do in bed before getting tossed aside like a used tissue. At the same time, one of the cultists somehow missed the broadside of this barn, but moves in for the kill. When Deus Ex Burrows pops up and stabs her in the foot, she throws her head back to scream, looking like a tortoise that stubbed its toe. With the grandma pinned to the ground and one of them mysteriously absent for some reason, the Harfoots run over to help the incapacitated stranger by taking Feminem's mic stand. She follows this up by torching the immediate forest and trapping three of the halflings while Nori gives the stranger the boost he needs. Just before the other three are about to be deep fried like chicken nuggets, the stranger extinguishes the flames, tells Feminem he was always a Tom McDonald fan, and blows them all away by turning them into moths? And apparently they're Nazgul, but the rings of the kings of men haven't even been made yet. So how are they? Whatever, they're gone, okay? The fight is over, and now the plot kicks in to kill Sadik, who wants to sit there and wait for the sunrise. But he won't be left alone as the other Harfoot and the stranger decide to sit with him and watch it as it comes up. And completely ignore the fucking stranger's ability to regenerate an entire grove! What the hell? So presumably the next day, the group returns to the grove. Everything seems to have settled, the stranger is getting ready to leave, and Nori tells him goodbye. Then Nori talks with Poppy and her family, who have made her a makeshift backpack so that Bimbo Baggins here could leave with the stranger who for some reason hasn't left yet, and this goodbye is milked like the ending of the Return of the King. Lastly, we jump over to Eregion, where Galadriel and Halbrand the Spleenless ride epically in front of a green screen and arrive at a brisk pace of only six Six days. So I guess the Fellowship just took the scenic route? Once through the gates, Galadriel bumps into Elrond, who is just as surprised as any other elf should be that the person they sent away has reappeared like a long-lost father who finally caught the elusive gallon of milk. So the elves take in Halbrand and patch him up. Then Galadriel, the padded out, has a sit-down with Elrond, and he apologizes because he was obviously wrong, and Galadriel mentions she left from the boat with 
basically no plan. And alright, it's about time that was addressed properly. So they have their talk and we are popped over to Grandpa Brimbor's forge where Hellbrand comes wandering in. Like, what the fuck? Is Elvish Medicine a one-a-day? I know who he is, but still, the dude looked like he was on an organ donor list 30 seconds ago, so for him to just wander in like nothing happened should be kind of a hint that something's not right. But I guess Grandpa Brimbor is having a moment so this scene can happen with only one or two questions and no further inquiry. Of course, without skipping a beat, Halbrand begins to work the shaft about how great Grandpa Brimbor's taste in smithing is and how his forge is so much bigger than he expected. Then Halbrand notices the plug of Mithril and suggests that Celebrimbor mix it up because he shouldn't just be doing the same old thing day to day. And believing he has now satisfied Celebrimbor, Halbrand leaves him with almost a wink as everyone gets ready for Gilgalad's arrival the next day. So what feels like not an hour later, Gilgalad, Celebrimbor, Elrond, and Galadriel are discussing what to do. Gilgalad is as unimpressed with what he's being told by the others as I have been with him all season, but the others keep trying to persuade him and Celebrimbor keeps dropping lines that hit you in the nose harder than pure Nicaraguan cocaine, with lines like, his suggestion were but the key that unlocked the dam, or not of strength, but of spirit, not of the flesh, but over flesh. And it is the latter that finally perks up Galadriel's ears like a meerkat on watch duties as she finally begins to grow curious of Halbrand. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad Karen Sue is finally starting to think for once in her life, but she's so late to the party, the cops already shut it down. Anywho, Gilgalad is fed up with the hypotheticals and orders the city to be disbanded and all of its occupants to leave. Then Elrond follows Gilgalad, asking for three more months to work on whatever it is that they decide to work on. Meanwhile, Galadriel asks asks Grandpa Brimbor who told him what he said earlier, and he has yet another moment of seniority when he cannot recall who it was. So Galadriel orders a steward to look into the lineage of the royalty of the Southlands. So work on the Mithril begins, and Halbrand is already in top condition, even helping in the process while Galadriel stands in the corner like she's waiting to talk to the manager, and after one of many attempts, there is an explosion in Celebrimbor's workshop. As the group learns, forcing Mithril to bond with other metals has as much of an effect as splashing water on a grease fire. Then, Halbrand takes some words that Galadriel says as a literal suggestion to better approach the process, and Celebrimbor agrees. Then the Abercrombie model also notices that Galadriel is suspicious suspicious of him and goes to thank her for everything down by the river, where Galadriel is holding a scroll that shows the lineage of Southland royalty ending over a thousand years ago with no heirs to speak of. Mick fucking excuse you? You took the time to research and confirm the crest Halbrand has as a royal sigil, but you didn't think to conclude whether or not the line had been broken back in Numenor? Alright, you know what, whatever. Whatever happens to you is probably deserved at this point. And so during this confrontation, Halbrand is actually revealed to be Sauruman. Kidding. Of course he's Sauron, everyone knew this in his first episode. She then goes to stab him, which fails, and he gets inside of her head and tries to portray Finrod to convince her to join him which also fails. Then they are on the raft, and he confronts her face to face and tells her it was a good thing Morgoth was defeated because he saw the light of the One once more and wants her to be his queen. Yep, they turned Sauron into an incel. So she resists, and an unintentionally hilarious moment happens. So here you go. What will they do when you tell them that you are my ally? When you tell them that Sauron lives? Because of you! And you will die because of me! Yeah! What the? I can't believe these are the standards we have fallen to in 2022. Just send the fucking meteor. So after their first ever fight, she's just tossed into the water, which turns out to be the creek, and Elrond finds her, and then she goes to try and stab him. But he quickly plagiarizes the It's Ya Sam scene from the two towers, so he gets to live. Then Galadriel runs off without explanation to Celebrimbor and refuses to warn anyone that Halbrand is Sauron. Elrond is even asking the obvious question, and she just ignores him. But she has her own questions to answer, like is Celebrimbor under his sway, and must she prevent the corruption of the material to make whatever it is that they're gonna fucking make? And when she gets there, oh, he's not there. Be did Sauron fuck back off to Mordor? Oh uh, yeah, he did. He even stopped at the local thrift shop to get himself an evil villain cloak. Wait, so he didn't try to stay and corrupt the rings? Or Celebrimbor? So he was only there to help them forge 
something? Why? Well, we'll touch on all this a little later, as Galadriel has sort of helped Celebrimbor snap out of it, and quickly concludes there should be a third ring to balance it all out, because no one is being told anything. Galadriel will still not say why there should be a third ring, but they make it anyway, and it requires the most pure gold and silver one could find. In this case, Finrod's dagger. They even shoehorn in the Eye of Sauron visual so the NPCs can tweet about it. And there we have it, the three elven rings of power. And they look just like the plastic jewelry you'd get out of those acorn cap vending machines. And thus finally ends Season 1 of the Rings of Power. It has been a long, almost nine hours of bad acting, hit and miss CGI, awful writing, crap pacing, unremarkable soundtracks, abhorrent logistical mistakes, poor choreography, and more questions than an SAT. So, what more can be said? Well, quite a bit, surprisingly enough. The first thing that comes to mind was the challenge that, like many other shows or movies before, it was to make us believe what is happening on screen. Of course, it doesn't have to be realistic in the sense of it must be one-to-one -one of how our world works. This is a world of elves, dragons, and magic. No shit, it isn't real, but that doesn't excuse the laziness. What we experience as the audience should be reasonable regardless of what world or genre a story is told in. Perhaps the best example of this break in immersion is when Galadriel, with no special abilities to speak of, survives the pyroclastic flow to her face when so many other people around her are dead. This would be the equivalent of the Tyrannosaur from Jurassic Park biting down on Owen Grady, but instead of being devoured like a sleazy lawyer, he holds the jaws open with his bare hands until she spits him out and gives up and walks away. It's just like the same issue that many people pointed out about the Watchmen, in which we have regular humans who for no reason at all have super strength. It only exists for the cool moments that would have been better if the attributes were absent. Then we have the sheer amount of hypocrisy and copium looking like the mountain of cocaine from Scarface that NPCs have been ingesting to sustain their denial of reality. If the Rings of Power was good, no one would be blasting this show and I wouldn't be dropping truth bombs like it's Nagasaki. When corporate media like The Guardian or shills like Angry Joe have come to align their perspectives with those of, well, nerdrotic, critical drinker, melancholy, Mac or myself, then you might just be wrong. And all of that starts when people simply ask questions, like why didn't the Harfoot ask the stranger to heal Sadek? Well, the wizards cannot heal people like that. Doesn't matter, showing the stranger has the capability to regenerate other things should apply to other people as well. By not asking this of him, the Harfoot and Stranger lose a notch of intelligence in our eyes. And if this power to heal others is performed in later seasons, then it only magnifies this scene and its problems more. You cannot just deny this simple fact. How about Sauron, who didn't try to corrupt or steal the rings or even the material to make them? In the canon, he teaches Celebrimbor a process that secretly includes Sauron's influence so he could take control of the other rings later when the One Ring is completed. With this information omitted, it brings to question why the fuck Sauron was even there to help them in the first place. Even if we assume Sauron is learning how to smelt mithril, why didn't he knock out Celebrimbor and take the mithril for himself to make the One Ring and enchant it on an obsidian table at a later time? It is questions like these that help to ultimately determine if something is good or bad. When the aforementioned have pointed out the same things as we have, then you might want to think about asking questions yourselves. Questions like, what is with the hypocrisy? For a show that people claim is so diverse, I find it rather odd an entire established race was race swap. Is it because they're villains? Was this done for the same reason that people bitched out Netflix so their recent Dahmer series would be removed from the LGBT genre? I mean, was this to avoid any negative representation? The Easterlings are specifically described with pale yellow skin, straight black hair, and dark eyes. They are literally of oriental descent, so why would this show essentially erase that? Isn't that one of the arguments woke tarts subscribe to? That we need more Asian representation? I'm totally fine with it, but to get rid of it here seems a little hypocritical, don't you think? Even the orcs were color swapped for no good reason. There isn't one of them in this show that is darker than soiled tidy whities Why are they all as pale as the Irish? Well, Jackson didn't get that wrong. Or wait, is it because you, not my followers or I, but you, 
think that orcs and Urukai are black people? Because I distinctly remember a few times this became a tism when a bunch of racist leftists started claiming orcs and black folk were one and the same, which is patently insane. Listen, I get it. You want to mix up the people of Numenor or the Harfoots like a bag of trail mix, but the peoples of Middle-earth, Rune, and Harad are long-established deep cultures, and to so brazenly disregard all of that just disproves the inclusion narrative. And another thing I haven't really touched on before is the incredibly underwhelming soundtrack. I like Bear McCreary's work, The Walking Dead, Godzilla, etc., but here I couldn't hum you a theme from this series if you held a gun to my head. Perhaps it has more to do with the mixing, but regardless, this is one of the main reasons this series has the emotional impact of an extra being killed off-screen. Sadik's death the ignition of Mount Doom, or the various battles, even just casual music meant to relate to a specific location or individuals is almost totally absent or so minimal you don't feel the emotion. Try to recall the themes for Linden, Eregion, or Casa Doom because I sure as hell can't. And I'm not saying everyone should recognize every note in every song, but when I hear the opening G major... I know what song I'm about to enjoy. Howard Shore managed to do for Lord of the Rings what Alan Silvestri did for the Avengers, or John Williams did for... fucking you name it, but the music here is forgettable like a tumbleweed through a speed dating event. Now, for those curious about it, yes, there are some things that aren't half bad, though this list is shorter than John McEnroe's temper. Some visuals come immediately to mind. Events like the eruption of Mount Doom itself look fine, while moments like the Belrog are far superior on a technical level than Jackson's. But that is just technological progression. Of course it should look better, as there are many, many scenes in Jackson's trilogy that really haven't aged well from 20 years ago. So when what should look better is noticeably inferior or on par with movies from said 20 years ago, then you know it is due to incompetence. Moving on, some of the characters are consistent while most were gobbled up by the script, to continue the USS Indianapolis metaphor. After episode 6, Torpedo, the best character in the show, the Fresh Prince of Noldor, now I have to default to Disa and totally not Gandalf as probably the most consistent members of the cast. Acting included. And that really says it all, I suppose. There is nothing much else here that holds up or attempts to help reach emotional payoff. If I ignored all the criticisms, then I have no emotional connection to anything happening on screen. And if I ignore the emotion, then the show doesn't hold up to criticism. The end result is a show that would put you to sleep faster than an uppercut by Mike Tyson. I don't care for anyone or anything in this series. The characters are mostly terrible, and the writing is amateurish at best. Characters make asinine choices that lead to preordained events, sacrificing the emotional connection and immersion for superficial dopamine hits. My people, I respect your time as much as you've respected in mind, so I'm not going to sit here and repeat every point I've made on this series. I think I've done a pretty good job breaking it down episode to episode and discussing different points in each video, for the most part at least. Amazon's The Rings of Power is one of the objectively worst series ever produced I have seen, and I hope you've enjoyed these videos as much as I thank you for watching them. Now I can get back to the other projects I threw on the afterburner and get back to discussing other topics. So thank you again, and I'll see you in the next video.